on artivism, using art to incite social change. Here with me today are four important people working in the field, ready to tell us a bit more about the topic and to help us understand its importance. First of all, we have Sultan Saud Al Qasimi, founder of Berjil Art Foundation, educator, columnist, researcher. He also founded the online cultural majlis that was such a wonderful source of knowledge during this year. Second on the panel is Lulwa Al Asaimi, artist, educator, and mother. She taught artivism in high schools in Chicago and in the Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles Co County Museum of Art. Next, we have Fabiha Munir, a photojournalist and activist documenting and reporting on major topics in Bangladesh, for example, women's rights and Rohingya refugees. And lastly, but certainly not least, Aline Deschamps, a photographer whose work focuses on gender and migration and was currently in Beirut documenting migrant domestic workers from Sierra Leone. Hello, everybody. Hope you're having a good morning. I just would like to introduce all of you to say a little bit more about yourself while we're waiting for people to join our live session. Sultan, if you'd like to start. Um, yes, thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Ranin. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I mean, this is the kind of panel I like, uh, where I am outnumbered by more intelligent uh, people who, who happen to be women. Uh, I mean, this is something you will never see in a financial or political uh, panel, but this is what I love about the art and the creative sector. It really is a level uh, platform, and it just shows you that when things are leveled, women really outnumber men and they do much better than men. Uh, this, the second thing I want to say is um, it's quite challenging for us to be speaking about such a diverse uh, topic uh, in such a short time. I mean, it's going to be a challenge, it's going to be fun, but it reminded me of the saying, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. You know that saying, it takes so much more effort to think and compress ideas in a shorter time. Um, as you said, I, I, uh, I'm teaching now in Paris, and so my presentation today will be based on some of my research about uh, political art and artistic um, activism in the Middle Eastern region. Wonderful, Sultan. Thank you. I'm very excited to see this presentation. Lulwa, if you'd like to speak a little bit more, uh, more about your experience in artivism. Sure. Thank you. And thanks, Sultan. That was really great. Um, I'm so happy and honored to be invited to to be with you all to learn and explore and to share and you know for everyone in the audience um, to take the time out right especially in these times um, to listen to us share is so important so thank you um yeah so i was um i'm an artist educator mother i started um my career on the south side of chicago teaching artivism um, art plus activism as well as arts integrated um, english course called the art of communication so that's really where my, my theories and practice really started and evolved um, as an educator and an artist. Um, since then, I serve communities as a teaching artist through various organizations, I um, learning spaces, I lead professional developments for teachers, workshops for youth and adults, um, and then as well as um, cultivating my own practice as an artist, which is always evolving. So today I hope to share with you guys um, some of my ideas and experiences on um, as an artist and an educator and how both of these um, interchange and feed off of each other. Um, and maybe some new ideas and perspectives on the role of an artist and educator um, and, it's, and our impact. So thank you so much for having me. That's wonderful, Lulu, I'm so excited. Fabiha? Thank you so much, Raleen, for this lovely introduction. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure being here. It's a real honor that today all of us can discuss about this important topic. So um, let me introduce myself first. I'm a visual journalist based in Bangladesh. Uh, as a humanist photographer, I tell people-focused stories that explore the theme of social development, migration, gender violence, and forced exile in the marginalized communities. So today I'm going to discuss about some of my project and what I am doing in Bangladesh as a female visual journalist of color, basically. So yeah, it will be an amazing discussion, I hope so. Yeah, Fabiha, your projects have been wonderful to learn about uh, during this time, um, and we're excited to show it to the audience. Um, Aline, 
if you would like to say a little bit about yourself. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> the same thing. It's really an honor to be a part of this amazing panel. Um, for me, I was quite surprised when I uh, got invited to this panel because I feel that I'm still like very young and still very new uh, in the field. And then I thought that maybe um, I feel new because um, actually I was always kind of like uh, driving in between photojournalism, art and international relations. And that it was only until recently that I found my place as, a, as an activist and as an artist. And uh, I think that my presentation will talk a lot of this uh, maybe personal journey. Um, and I hope that, uh, yeah, it will inspire people to actually um, really touch base with what they, they feel that they don't have to fit into like a case, uh, but that they can actually just, um, yeah, just connect with themselves uh, as a professional. <laughs> this is so exciting. I feel like we're going to have a really well-rounded presentation and view about the term artivism and the concept of creating art that can incite social change from collectors to um, uh, educators to people who are actually on the ground creating this work. Um, I think these presentations are fantastic and I'm so excited for everyone to see them. So Saroud, if you would like to start us off with some history and background, Okay, well, uh, th thank you once again, uh, Ranin. It's, uh, first of all, I want to say that we, and for, for us to understand the 20th century in the Middle East and the Arab world, it's important for us to contextualize where this region is coming from. I always have difficulties trying to explain that there is a continuation of artistic and creative um, uh, creations uh, in the Arab world uh, over the past few centuries. People think of uh, the 20th century in isolation from what has come before then. So uh, the Arab world has traditionally relied on poetry, for example, as an art form. So po poets were so revered that their work, their poetry would be prominently displayed in the greatest places, in, including on the Kaaba, the Holy Shrine in Mecca, before even the founding of Islam, uh, we had a very famous poet called al Ma'arri who advocated for social justice through his poetry. He even advocated, and this blows people's minds when I say this, for vegetarianism, for shunning of meat. So he said that you could live without this. So it's an incredible idea that 1,500 years ago or 1,000 years ago, poets in the Arab world would talk about things like that. I mean, his most famous book was called the epistle of forgiveness. So idea, the idea of forgiveness, the idea of social justice. Again, this is a poet and this predates 20th century art. But even in the 1960s and 70s, again, uh, to draw this arc, uh, um, social justice was featured prominently in the works of poets like Muhammad Fuad Nigam, who, who once wrote that um, we are a society that only cares about the hungry when there are voters, when they are voters, and we only care about women when they are naked. And so the idea is, uh, again, presenting through these strong words, the idea of social justice and women's rights. But I think one of the reasons is that artists, including painters and sculptors, have a unique access to the corridors of power because they 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 were sort of like a bridge between those in government and the and the uh, everyday man and woman in the street. Uh, they would mix with both very easily, and that's why their message would be relayed uh, maybe easier than other people, like the el other elites. Let's say they are still elites. Um, they yeah, would this be Sorry, mm -hmm. continue. No, no, no. I didn't want no, to interrupt. Please interrupt me. <laughs> no, but this is very similar to something that Fabiha was telling me on our phone call, is that when she works, she's literally taking these stories and she's giving them to uh, the WHO organization and to uh, Oxfam and things like that. So, yeah, this is still happening, the same process. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, obviously, all the work of Lulu and Aline and Fabiha, this is exactly the kind of activism that, that uh, because we are elite, you know, we, we do have access to equipment, we do have access to individuals and media channels that the everyday men and women don't. And so we have this responsibility, at least I think you have, you are the creative, I am an educator, uh, as you said, uh, and so you guys have access to these corridors of power and you can relay this information. Uh, I mean, if you think in the 20th century across the, the region, the Middle East, whether it's Iran or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Iraq, Egypt, 
all these countries have monuments to freedom and to liberty, uh, including, for example, maybe the most famous monument in the region, 1950s uh, Baghdad uh, monument to uh, liberation or monument to freedom by Iraqi sculptor Jawad Salim. That's maybe one of the most prominent ones. It is really running much too rushed to talk about this, but I want to give you a quick idea about the past 20 years, there have been the continuation of artist activism in the region, whether it's through social media, through graffiti, through film, and even more recently through comic books. People don't think of comic artists today in the Arab world so much, but there's so many different comic artists, whether it's Naif al Mutawa and his The 99, or um, uh, our late friend Suleiman al Bakhit, who had uh, a comic uh, book called um, Aranim, and he was trying to explain to young kids to shun extremism. And the last thing I will say is movies are a very, very important tool for sort of artivism or social uh, justice. Think of the movies of the Lebanese film director Nadine Lebaki. She talks about issues like uh, female genital mutilation, child labor bootlegging, domestic abuse, things that, uh, you know, that are very important to talk about. So uh, Nadine Lebaki, Mohamed Diab, and so many other film directors are doing a great job. I'm going to stop here. Thank you. This is something actually that my husband is a filmmaker as well. And this is something that I talk to him. He's always like, what am I doing? What am I spending my life on? Not making any change in this world. Like, how can I make a difference? And I'm just like, you don't understand how important movies are to explain specific things to the generation, the mass population and everybody around us. And I just wanted to touch on what Sultan was saying, how it is so important that we recognize that this isn't new, that this has all been built throughout history, throughout movements, throughout practices. You know, when we think of artivism as an educator, I invite um, people to unpack what they think of when they hear artivism or art or who's the artist what medium are they working in? Because when we think about artivism, it can be everything, the written word, imagine. Storytelling throughout history, cultures, like that was crucial, right? Um, so not just paint, but linguistics, how we communicate, you know, um, education, all these are forms of artivism. So foods, what we're eating, what we're consuming, who's, you know, who's bringing the food to us? Um, you know, how do we create spaces? Um, how do we make space, you know? How do we take up space? I'll talk about that a little bit further, but I really loved that this idea that, you know, artivism is so much more than maybe what um, someone might think of right away when they hear the term artivism or even activism, right? Activism can be such a loaded word for people, but it really is everyday things that we can already be doing in our lives. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's exactly what we're trying to talk about today. and. Um, it's mind blowing to think that uh, this term really didn't exist for a very long time. And when I got the invitation to moderate this panel and I saw the word artivism, I was a little bit shocked. I was like, wow, we're going to go there. Sure. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about how art can really be a tool and how for centuries it was um, controlled and, um, you know, uh, just uh, try to like be um, censored in different ways and yeah to see this panel in front of me of people who are doing such amazing things I'm really excited to to get into it. I also want to add something like as Sultan and Lulua say that I uh, that we can see that everyone is connected I mean humanity is connected in a very bigger form because when I was working in Greece in the refugee camp so I saw that uh, young children was drawing their home their parents their lost belongings and then in 2017 I mean uh, 2015 and 2016 I was working in Greece and then 2017 in Bangladesh when I was working in the Rohingya camp the children was drawing the same thing, their home, their belongings, their cat, their dogs. So I feel this is the connection. I mean, emotion is everything. So artivism comes from emotion. And as a human, we can connect with each other. And that is how this activism comes in our life. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I can definitely like rely on that. And just to go back on like the different way of um, uh, artivism, how it worked, like for me when I was young, 
I thought that um, I would use like my my art as a social lever, but I only understood it from my uh, financial perspective, meaning that I thought that because I would like um, sell my work and lead to fundraising, that was artivism. But I didn't integrate that like actually the work itself um, can um, give like meaningful stories. And as you were saying, uh, stories that people can connect to. Uh, and images that can be filled because we're talking about uh, photojournalism for for our work. Um, it, it is really something that um, create changes because it doesn't just give information. Uh, people like connect to it. It's just not numbers. People connect to it, and um, and has an impact on like uh, the social life. It's wonderful. I think um, if everyone uh, is comfortable, we can start with our presentations. Uh, Sarud, if you'd like, Sultan, if you'd like to start. Uh, okay. Um, let me see. Hopefully, this will not let me down. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, uh, first of all, I want to apologize because there's no way I'm going to be talking about the 20th century in the Middle East in terms of artistic activism in these few minutes. So, I'm sorry if I miss any country or any artist. It's just you know, it's just overwhelming uh, the amount of information, which is a great thing. Anyway, this is a very famous painting. And I mentioned the issue of hunger when Mohammed Fuad Negem, the Egyptian poet in the 1960s, quote said, um, you know, politicians only think of the hungry when they're voters. So this is going back 20 years before that, the 1940s. Uh, this is the second version of a painting called The Theater of Life or Hunger or popular chorus, it has so many names. And it was uh, it was really a groundbreaking painting by this Egyptian artist uh, called Abdel Hadi Al-Ghazar, who was maybe in his early 20s those days. Uh, and he obviously here tried to uh, have a, a commentary on, uh, on social justice and hunger. And so you see this popular chorus or a group of uh, women, notice it's women, and they all have empty plates in front of them again. It's a painting that caused the artist to be thrown in detention. So the artist was detained because of this painting. It's a very, very important painting in the mid 20th century in, in Egypt. And he wanted to show different kinds of sort of social backgrounds. So you see women wearing some kind of, you know, they're more clothes, different clothes. They look like they're coming from the countryside, maybe from the city, maybe from the village. So that was a very important uh, painting. I want to say that. Um, men and women artists in the 20th century also raised the idea of students' rights and workers' rights. Workers' rights was a big deal, the idea of what workers, uh, are the dues, the, the rights of workers, the union, unionizing or um, forming labor unions was also uh, prominently featured in many paintings. This is by Gazbi Yasserri, uh, uh, an artist who, uh, knock on wood, is still alive in her 90s now. This is a painting dating back from the mid 20th century. Again, I just wanna show you how laborers, this is an Iraqi painting, uh, continuously was a theme, the idea of laborers who are not given their dues. This is by Kadam Haidar of Iraq. And here, the idea of women laborers. So women laborers, uh, uh, Syria was going through a uh, drought. And, and I think here, what Leyland Sayer was trying to do is show the role of women in, in, in sort of feeding the country, a very important artist who also is still alive. I'll talk a little bit about Inji Aflatun, who is one of my favorites. Um, she is the equivalent of Frida Kahlo uh, for us in the Arab world. Very, very important artist who grew up uh, in Egypt in a wealthy household, but then she decided to take up the issue of activism. So she was very, very interested in issues of social justice. So for example, this painting, she talks about um, women uh, prisoners in Egypt and what they went through. These are these are uh, prisoners who might have gone in jail for minor offenses, maybe uh, a debt that the family couldn't pay. And even the idea of the painting, the, the title, the dreams of a detainee, the dreams uh, of, of freedom, the dreams of, uh, you know, being, being back in, in public life, is something that featured prominently in the work of Inji Aflatun. Um, but I want to also say that Middle Eastern artists didn't only think about Middle Eastern social justice causes. So artists like uh, Ibrahim Salahi from Sudan depicted a, a huge, important painting of Patrice Lumumba, the, fir the first uh, elected uh, president of the Democratic Republic of Congo, who was killed. So 
Bahman Muhassis from Iran depicted Martin Luther King. Gazbiya Sirri also depicted the, 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 the black civil rights movement. And here you have N.G. Aflatun depicting the great Angela Davis, the uh, human rights activist from, uh, from the U.S. Again, Middle Eastern artists, when they think, when you think of social justice, don't live in a bubble. They also think about rights of other people, whether it's in Africa, in Asia, but also in, 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 in the sort of developed Western states, North America and elsewhere. That's a very important point. But maybe bringing it back to the Gulf, where we are from, uh, where I am from here, uh, a Saudi artist, Manar al personal friend of mine as well. She photog- she did this whole series, and I think we have a couple of photographers here with us on the panel would, would like maybe to learn more about this. Uh, Manal Dwayan is, is a hugely important young Saudi artist. Um, and what I think she was uh, incensed by a quote by some person who said, women should do any job as long as it's suitable for women. And so she said, well, let me show you what women have been doing anyway. So she has an entire series called I am a petroleum engineer. I am a computer scientist. I am a driver. I'm a scuba d- diver. I'm a diplomat. So she actually went and photographed Saudi women who were already in these jobs. They were already computer scientists. These are not actors or actresses. They are not role playing. These are actual diplomats and computer scientists and very accomplished individuals that she photographed and wanted to highlight. And this is, you know, this is about what, 15, six, this is 2006. So you can imagine how artists come with a very benevolent message, trying to uh, introduce ideas into society. Because keep in mind, many of these petroleum engineers and computer scientists were unknown to us as a society at large. We didn't know about them, but through her lens, through her photography, she's highlighted them. She's put them front and center. Uh, These works are now collected by museums. They are displayed. They are in the magazines and the newspapers. And Manal, amongst many, many young artists from the Gulf and from Saudi Arabia, played an important role, I think, in introducing the idea of these women's rights, uh, social justice uh, issues into uh, not only um, the the general public, but I think especially in the corridors of power also to sort of reinforce the idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sultan, for that wonderful presentation and a very short peek into specific (laughs) artworks. I was wondering, actually, while I was looking at the works, what other themes did artists from the 50s, 40s, and then so on speak about? Oh, Um, I mean, oh, 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 we we started. Well, the artists in the 1950s, remember, Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia was going through a massive emancipation movement, a freedom movement, trying to get rid of the yoke of colonialism and be independent states. And so, yes, they talked about Uh, uh, issues like nationalism, issues like freedom, issues like dignity, issues like identity, like uh, we want the right to publish in our language, we want the right to speak in our, why are you forcing your European languages over us? Why are you forcing your European norms over us? And it's incredible when you think about it that um, that artists, uh, that, that this continued over three, four decades and even after. So in the 40s, you see the independence of South Asia and the 50s in North Africa. It continues all the way into the 60s across the African continent. And so um, I, national identity, but also women's rights. NG Flatoon, the artist I showed you a picture that she painted the woman in jail, she actually was going around collecting signatures in uh, in Egypt for women's rights. So yes, these are major themes that until today continue to reverberate and we haven't even been 100% successful in ending sort of the influence and the legacy of colonialism in so many countries in South Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa. It's an ongoing process. It might take 100 years. Of course, yeah, no. (laughs) <laughs> it's still happening today. And that's an interesting thought because I was also going to ask you about, um, we're, we're very active on social media. Um, we are always posting things about creating social change. I wanted to um, ask you through your research and from the past few years, do you feel like social media has breaking down those barriers about how we experience art and how we experience art that's creating social change? Uh, I mean, I must say that social media has really had, I think it's a do, how do you say it? Do, do Double edged sword. Yeah. sword. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes if you want to consume negativity, 
you can drown in social media. There's so much negativity on it, but I think you have to curate your own feed so that you're following people who are educating you. You're following people who are enlightening you. You're following positive people. Yes, you should know about the negativity in the world. Don't hide away. But I think that there are people who sort of can be consumed by it. And I think for us, Ranin, in the arts world, and you're all in the arts world, that social media has really helped us uncover uh, uh, important artists, important uh, themes. I mean, in, in the collection, in the Barjil collection, I discovered so many women artists who were shunned and who were ignored over the 20th century through social media. Because again, the art industry were was controlled and is still sort of managed and controlled by men. And men were highlighting men, men were showing men. I just showed you a painting by Angel of Angela Davis. It was painted by a woman. So women sort of have a different way of looking at things that we men aren't able to see, apparently. We are completely sort of, um, I don't know what the word is. Uh, we have this uh, narrow it. view yeah, of the world. <laughs> and so we need to be educated by, by other men and, and women. That's so important. And so social media has been very important. The one thing I would say is uh, uh, not... Instagram stories. So you have to make sure that whatever you're featuring is there because if you're going Ranin, into an archive and you're photographing documents and then if it disappears in 24 hours, I feel so sad because you can't find it. But if you're putting it on uh, Facebook, on a blog, on Twitter or Instagram, um, the feed, you can find it. So I, I, this is a, a request from people. Please, if you're putting something on stories, put it also in the feed so we can find it later. Agreed. Yeah. Um... Thank you for all of that information. That was great, Sultan. Thank you so much. I'm going to move to Lulua so that she can talk to us about her presentation. She has a lot to tell us and I'm excited to hear from her. Thank you so much, Renee. Okay, I'm gonna try and get my, um, my screen. All right, we're good? Okay, so I'm Lulua. Um, I'm an artist and I'm an educator. And I say I'm a mother, but I'm also a student. I love Sultan. He's schooling me on so much that I, you know, I'm taking it all in. I'm Kuwaiti American. I was born in Kuwait. I was raised um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota in the U.S. Um, and now I live in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So I love hearing um, all of your gems of knowledge that you're giving us today. Um, so, you know, we already talked about um, how the definition of artivism and how to really unpack that. I created a brief list, okay? And by in no means, I don't want to define what artivism is or say what the artivist role is, but just for you to see, you know, how all of these things are what we can be doing in our everyday lives. So, right, so the term of artivism, you know, it might be newer to, you know, in generations, you know, in the last, you know, how many decades, but um, art being a form of um, activism and a catalyst for, you know, personal and social movements um, has been since the beginning of time, right? So we know when we think about this oppression, injustice, marginalization, the need to express and to have voice, um, you know, this isn't new. And it's always been um, a form of expression for the people, for response, for resistance, um, et cetera. So, you know, when we think of those who laid the groundwork, like Sultan was saying, there is no way that we can touch on this here. Um, but it is so important to understand how all of these movements, all of these experiences, all of these, you know, mediums have all played a role to where we are today. Um, and so, now a little bit of theory, okay, I will try not to bore you guys too much, but I, as an educator, I talk often about praxis, right, and the importance of praxis. So the idea of praxis is really important to me as an educator, but also as an artist. So I just kind of want to explain what that looks like. And, you know, it's, it's something that um, the other two have already touched on, this idea that it's not what we're doing isn't about theory, but it's about pra practice and like what follows the action, right? So um, being in praxis, um, we, you know, we look at theory and how important theory is and we explore that. And then we take our time to reflect on that theory, okay? And then that's when we lead into action. So what are we gonna do with what we know? What are we gonna do with, you know, what's our purpose? And then we always have to make time and space for that reflection to happen as well. 
And then that action and that reflection then leads into redefining, adding to that theory that we had. So again, being in this constant state of inquiry and um, curiosity and in reflection is really important um, as an educator, especially what I do when it comes to teaching art and artivism. Um, and then if we can think about it from the, the position of an artist, right, and artivism. So it might look like we have an issue that we want to look at. We want to reflect on what that looks like. So, yeah, so when it comes to artivism, it's really important that whatever we're doing, we're not just theorizing about it, but we're actually putting it into action and then reflecting on it and seeing how that then influences theory again, right? For future, for past, for whatever. So it's, again, it's really important as educators, as artists, especially in community work, to be in praxis, always in this, um, this process with ourselves. So with that being said, I wanted just to highlight um, an artivist that I know. And when I think about artivism, something that is so huge is accessibility, right? So how is art accessible? Um, and this is uh, William Estrada's work. Um, he, if you look at the left image, um, he has created something called a mobile street art cart and it's designed to function to be able to be pushed or to be put on a bike. And he had studied um, Mexican um, food vendors and you know, their carts. And so he really wanted to think about how can he make art um, and art making and collaboration um, accessible. So I just wanna read a couple points that he says. So it's designed to achieve the following, to provide free art projects with people on the streets in their neighborhoods, address issues relevant to the community, uh, create a temporary space where the community and him can talk about art, right? And its impact. So again, as artists, it's not just us making work. It's not just us, you know, going out there and doing our thing, but really for the people with the people. Um, sharing resources to support art making and community building. Um, and it really is there to amplify the creativity that already exists in the community. So again, as artists and educators, we're not, there to give the knowledge. We're not the knowledge keepers, right? But it's a, it's a collaboration, what we do in our practice. Um, and then on the right, you'll see it's a poster. It says, um, Brown People for Black Power. And this was in collaboration with For the People's Artists Collective, where all of these artists created art. And now it's accessible for download for free. You can, you know, print it out, distribute it, do whatever. So again, it's like art for the people. How are we making art accessible? What is, our, what is our theory? What is our practice, right? How, how are we impacting? Um, how are we either taking up space or creating spaces, right? And I just wanted to include a couple photos from past work with um, students. Um, like I say, as an educator, I think it's really important um, that learning in the classroom learning space should be collaborative. So between the teacher, um, and the student. So I always want my curriculum to be reflective of my students' um, lived experiences. Um, and so this is middle school. This is actually sixth through eighth graders. Um, they explored stereotypes. Um, they uh, unpacked maybe stereotypes that they have received. And then we looked at who they are and who they really are and how they want to be seen and understood. So after unpacking through dialogue and different reflective activities, you know, exploring artists. We looked at Robin Rhodes on the right, who uses um, accessible materials, performance art. You know, we use chalk in the community. Um, and on the left, it was inspired by Kara Walker, who is an artist who uses really large scale um, silhouettes um, to create narratives. And then, okay, so my last um, slide is not working, but that's okay. Um, and so, yeah, so my, you know, my practice continues to evolve based on the students in the communities I'm serving, um, you know, and as well as being a mother, you know, having a baby has really encouraged me to be in, you know, be curious, you know, and make new meaning of the world around me. So that's why when I talk about who I am, it's important that I include being a mother because it's totally impacted who I am, my practice, 
you know, my new reflections. Um, and so, yeah. And then this is just a piece um, more recent from Jenny Holzer that I thought, thought was very important. So I just wanted that to play. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Lerua. That was beautiful. Should I? Um, yeah, like you're to good. just keep it on if you want. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions. Uh, there was a question that I wanted to ask you. How are you taking what you learned in the States and taking what you taught in the U in United States? And how do you think you're going to apply it now that you're back in the Gulf and that you're living in Saudi Arabia? What do you think the route is going to be, the path? Um, that is a great question, and it's something that I'm still exploring. Um, you know, I'm new here, so I'm the new kid on the block. So I am trying to see what that looks like in practice and as an artist as, and as, a, as an educator. You know, but when I was talking to a friend about, you know, what I'm going to be talking about and how she said, you know, you said that teaching is a political act. Like, that's pretty, you know, that's pretty loaded. You know, I told her and I was like, you know, but I want to unpack what people are you know, are worried about, you know, when I talk about it being a political act, it's how I'm navigating the classroom, right? Um, and like I said, so here, I feel like it both, it starts with children. So we can talk about artivism, we can make art, but think about where it starts outside of, you know, the family and caregivers, you know, school is where children explore and they question and they communicate, they cultivate understandings about themselves and their world around them and their place. And so as educators, you know, we have a huge responsibility um, to create those spaces and to create opportunities to humanize. Um, and so, yeah, in a classroom space, starting from a young age, you know, cultivating um, autonomy for themselves, right? Building agency so they can feel that they actually have a role in their communities and their country, right? So they're being cultural producers and they're not just consumers, right? Or just kind of riding the way. Um, you know, as teachers, we have the power to um, invite critical thinking, you know, and doers, thinkers and doers. So um, how that they can go back out into their communities. So I really think running like um, relearning and unlearning, you know, as teachers, we bring so much of how we were taught and how we learned into our classroom space. So I really do feel like um, you really have to unpack this idea that the teacher is the knowledge holder and the all knowing, right? And that, um, students should be participants, active participants in their learning and their classroom communities. Um, and I think that that is, you know, it's really, it's crucial. So I feel like it starts with schools. It starts with how our students, our children are learning, the opportunities they're given. Um, and yeah. Yeah, you were telling me that um, the idea you had was to focus more on the educators. Right. Mm -hmm. I do. But so how would, what would that look like? You know, I, you know, I could think of myself and say, oh, I want this for as an artist and I want this space as an artist, but I know that that is temporary. And so, you know, when I think about these spaces, so um, in education, so arts integration in schools, this is something that I did um, that was part of my thesis research at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, but how can arts integration, so art being integrated into core classroom curriculum, like how can that drive teachers' goals? Because we know that children learn differently, right? And arts, whether it's writing, speaking, you know, uh, fine art, it gives them an opportunity to have a voice to express, you know, in whatever medium is necessary for them, right? And so I think arts integration in schools, you know, um, more art for the people, Right, so not just in galleries, not just in exhibitions, you know, but more public art, arts for art's sake, um, public art, you know, museums, and inside those museums, having museum education, because we know that museums don't feel accessible, right? Even to me, I went to SAIC, and it's attached to a museum. Did I still feel confident going through that museum? You know, not always, right? So I, I think that that's really important. So I guess really getting back to the idea that art is for the people, and art and art making should be accessible. So how are we creating spaces? How are we, you know, stepping up when we need to and how are we stepping back to give that space? That's beautiful, Lulua. Thank you so much. 
for your presentation and for your really important words. I really appreciate you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Now we're going to move on to Fabiha. Uh, she's going to talk to us about her practice and hopefully we'll get to see a little bit of her work. So um, it's amazing, it's amazing. And we are really inspired by the work from both of you. So what I want to share is like my personal journey because I feel like um, this is where we start activism, artism, whatever you say that it is our personal journey. So um, Ranin, can you please share the slide for the audience? I want to tell about uh, myself and um, who I am, what I do and why I am doing it. So I'm a visual journalist based in Bangladesh. I use still images, text, and video to produce multifaceted storytelling for editorial and nonprofit clients. I use intimate and involved storytelling approach to communicate meaningfully about the human experience. As a humanist photographer, I tell people-focused stories that explore the themes of social development, migration, gender violence, and forced exile in marginalized communities. In the photograph, um, here is Bobita. She is 22 years old. She was in a style, uh, uh, they, they were taking some strike in the street. Those are happening by the textile workers. So she got injured and taken to the emergency room in the hospital. So she has been harassed by the her colleagues and other men in the factory who targeted letter and that was the result of her injury. So a deep rooted fear of shame and retaliation is helping to silence the survivor of sexual violence within Bangladesh garment industry. So this is one of the photographs. So why it is important, why we need to take ethical storytelling. I'm a passionate believer and practitioner of ethical storytelling. What most drive my work is the potential for storytelling to bring change and initiate dialogue. I'm drawn to change driven projects that serve a community or a cause. I believe that at the heart of change involves an intimate and involved storytelling approach. The lady that you are all seeing is a textile worker as well, but she is a union leader. During the time of COVID, she is helping the local textile workers. Okay, so this is one of the photographs from the Rohingya camp. This is the current situation. So I really believe photography can change the world because the photographer provides the first line of ethical defense. I often ask myself how my stories can drive change. Visual journalists play an important role providing vital information to communities affected by crisis. We have to continue to question how we tell these stories, make an impact and minimize risk both for ourselves and our subject. For an example, this is uh, one of the daughter of Ismat. She's a Rohingya refugee. So Ismat brought her daughter in the uh, clinic without the permission of her husband, because she realized that it is important to find out the reason of continual fever and cough of her child. So image is powerful. If we continue to tell these stories, if we share our images with the world, then things will change, people's behavior will change. And from society, from the marginalized society and underprivileged people will understand slowly but surely that they have to take part in this change as well. Can you please go to the next slide? So this is another picture from my climate change story. We have to ask the world to wake up. So my work focuses to create impact, to influence not only private individual, but decision makers and whole communities. As showing the injustice provides a mental shift and subsequent action from people who do have the power to incite change. So this is a couple who were devastated by the flood. So they couldn't dry their pillow for almost one week, uh, two to four days. So they were just shifting and taking whatever they have left with them. First responder, photojournalists have always worked on the front line of tragedy from covering the loss of life in local fires and accidents to recording the sweeping devastation of natural disaster and the reality of international conflict. 
In 2005, the American Psychological Association identified journalists as first responder, people who rush in toward a disaster at personal risk when all others are rushing away. This is what actually we are doing. I have covered all major disaster, cyclone, flood, fire tragedies, earthquake. So we are there and we respond first. We, this is what we are doing because we want to tell their stories. So I believe in collaboration. I strongly believe that the first step to changing injustice in today's society is to collaboratively imagine disadvantaged communities what a more just future could look like then visualize that new reality through images. So I have been collaborating with scientists and policymakers and other activists for many different projects. My last uh, documentary firm was on a Rohingya refugee mother. The name of the documentary firm is Shamima in my heart. So the film was about a mother who lost her daughter while they were crossing the border from Myanmar to Bangladesh. So they do not have any belonging of the daughter. So in that form, we were trying to find out that what is the memory of the girl. So that was the that was the film is all about. So we collaborated with my other partners, and then it it uh, last year it went it uh, it went to the New York Film Documentary Film Festival. So this is me. I'm covering. I'm on assignment for Oxfam in the Rohingya camp during cyclone and of course covering COVID-19. So from my part of the world, only a very few number of female journalists are covering COVID-19. Within my community, as a female visual journalist, I have immense access to the lives of women. Violence against women has increased. Homeless women and children are in greater danger. Transgender sex worker and the refugee communities are suffering from the crisis. So what is our duty? We have to influence everyone because it's our duty to continue our journey because we, as uh, Sultan Sa said, that we are elite. I, I think it, the time should be we are privileged because we have the power to reach to greater audience and we have that capacity to reach to broader audience. So this is how we will have the influence and impact on the people. That is why we cannot stop. We cannot just sit and think that, okay, we will we will not continue what we are doing. There will be definitely so many barriers in our um, in our industry. And we as a female photographer or artist or educator, we always face a different kind of difficulties, but this is why we are continuing this journey. Next slide, please. Diverse lens, uh, this is very important. So I want to share that only 15% of photojournalists are women. That means that we largely are consuming news whether about politics or entertainment or crime or sport through a male perspective. Female visual journalists are still struggling to reach proportional number of representation in the industry. There is a major diversity problem in the news industry. If we want to document people and places with nonsense and sensitivity, we need to be doing it as a diverse community of history tellers. It's crucial to highlight people that are putting conscious effort into evaluating diverse stories, not only women, but people of color and local photographers. So this is my presentation. I will discuss more about my photo project with Iranin, but this is what my journey is all about. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Fabiha, for that really informative presentation. Um, it's, it's amazing the work that you're doing. We can learn so much from you. Um, that was great. <laughs> Speechless. Yeah, yeah. Everyone is doing so much. So it's just our part. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to ask you, we were talking uh, when we were talking earlier, um, there was a really important topic that we touched upon, which was parachute journalists. Yeah. I think, uh, this is a yes. major problem in a lot of um, our region. Like it happens yes. also in Saudi, yeah. I'm sure it happens in India, it happens where you are in Bangladesh. So why do you think this is a toxic practice and how can we actively make sure that it stops happening? Um, see, there is, I, I dearly love my colleagues from everywhere because I am also learning from many of my colleagues. Like right now I am enrolled in eight program fellowship, mentorship and everything. So many of my respected teachers are from Western countries. So um, like there is no hatred or competition, but I really want to share uh, my perspective because there is a question of accountability. For an example, the cultural sensitivity 
that what I understand when I'm working in my reason, that is not possible to understand by a, uh, sorry to use this term, but a white male photojournalist. This is not at all possible. For an example, in the Rohingya camp, they are the world's most persecuted nation. So they are they're the minority and the women over there are uh, very restricted and they do not allow all men in their houses. But because of their circumstances, because they are now dependent on aid work, uh, I mean, aid agencies and so many aid factors. So now, like you just Google rape victims from the Myanmar. So you will see thousands of faces. I have also covered sexual violence harassment, I never show a single face of them. Because this is the issue of dignity. As a female journalist, I will never do it. When I will covering the textile worker project, the cost of your cloth, many of the girls say that I want to show my face. Why are you not showing my face? Then I said, no, because I know it is dangerous for them. Maybe we will, because there are hundreds of other ways to tell these stories. Activism is not that I will go there and tell about but why. There is always everywhere, the, uh, there is no, no picture of rape, rapist, but the rape survivors picture is everywhere. Why? Why is this? So this is why the accountability, because I will go back to my people. I will go back to them and they will ask me, what you have done with my picture? What you have done with my story? Show me your picture, because this is a very small world. Everyone has access to internet. But when they are coming, it's a matter of like, it is just a like three days. Uh, I, oftentimes I receive email from many Western male photographers that I want to come to Bangladesh and I want to do a, st a story on prostitution. Why? Like USA has the most, uh, you know, the, in, if you consider number wise, they have the most number in sex trafficking. Russia is the next, but consider why is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh is always in the limelight. And when they are just reporting on child marriage, I'm not advocating child marriage at all. Please don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying, I'm telling you that we have to go deep inside the story. Because when flood is hitting our reason, two months, parents are staying on the roadside day and night, 24 hours with their young daughters, four or five. Sex trafficking is happening. If you are a father or a mother, what you would do? You will look for a marriage because that's the first rescue for yourself. So we have to go deep inside the story. We, I just cannot go there and shoot a wedding that it take place. This is child marriage. It is happening in Bangladesh, rural Bangladesh. They are very uncivilized. They don't understand it at the end of the story. No, we can't do this. We have to go inside the story. We have to find a solution and we have to report from top to bottom, why it is happening. We have to go to the cause of the reason. Climate change, Bangladesh is not responsible for, uh, the, uh, for, for the majority of the, because you know that the contribution of Bangladesh is very little. The rich countries are responsible for climate change. So the girl who is getting married in my country, the rich countries are responsible. My country is not responsible. The farmer that you were accusing that the father has sold her daughter to the brothel, She's, he is not in this situation. So don't just, you know, uh, there, there is a sense, um, um, there is a term called like, I mean, uh, you, you know, in the headline that the husband sold the wife in the brothel. So why is this happening with only our part of the world? It is happening also in the Western countries. When you are showing that your summer, I mean, Western country summer, it is in the park, they are like, uh, walking and having a happy time. In our part of the world, in global south, in Africa, in Asia, it's a naked baby carrying a bucket of water with no dignity, with nothing, because they are not, um, I mean, they are not, very sorry to say, they're not sensitive to portray us. We have been subject in the industry for so many years. We are not Given the microphone, we are not invited in the table that we can sit and talk that, look, this is impacting us. And this is what happening in our reason. We have, this is the way. So yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just taking a long time and become no, very no, emotional. But time. Yeah. This is your time. I, I, feel, I feel the accountability. I feel the accountability because of my accountability. You, when a nonprofit organization is hiring, now it has changed a lot. Even two years ago, it was not like that. 
because many of them cannot speak bangla or because they need translator but when you are coming here you need different different level of translator then how you are getting this reporter i mean this is yeah. right so and uh, i mean we are we have the bestest for the journalists we have everyone here definitely they will come definitely they will work but i think we should have a balance like i i share that i was working in greece i was i was in moria camp i was not allowed to enter inside the camp i had the official paper with me because i am a brown girl i came from bangladesh that no one recognized mm -hmm. but all my other colleagues especially male colleagues were there and shooting and so i was asking like everyone is working i came from bangladesh yeah so uh, i mean I, i came here because the angel hired me and commissioned me to do this work i will have an exhibition in the banaki museum mm -hmm. but they didn't let me to work there i think this that is, this is this is systemic systematic racism this is systematic corruption yeah we have been silenced for so many years it's not right agreed thank you so much for viha this is really important words i hope all our listeners are taking it to heart and thinking about it that was very important thank you so much for your time beautiful thank work you. great presentation thank you again Aline, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, I just want to go back to Fabia. Like, thank you. That was um, really mind blowing in the sense that everything that you just said, uh, as a female photojournalist as well, I, I just recognize like everything. Uh, all the points that you said are so important, and um, so I just want to thank you for that. And I think it's a good transition because. Um, I have worked in photojournalism, but also um, in in more artistic projects. So I think that can be good to to link that. So as I was saying, my my presentation will be quite uh, personal. Um, and how it all started, uh, I think um, I will start from my teenage years, where basically I was drawn into worlds that I was reading in books that I was seeing like in films. And I had this like fantasy to go to Australia to study. <laughs> and basically it's like on the opposite side of France. So it was really to go to the furthest. And um, yeah, I think as a teenager, but also like as a human being, you always get inspired by what you, by what you see on the news, by what you read. And so I imagine Australia as, you know, a land full of um, Aboriginal art, um, indigenous uh, people. And, you know, it was like part of like this whole like stigmas and, and dreams. And so when I went to Australia to study, I was taking class of anthropology uh, in indigenous studies. And there it just completely like broke all my stereotypes uh, because I learned that 80% of um, ab Aboriginal people were actually uh, not living in the outback. They were urban people. They were living in the cities. And uh, my teacher and I um, go back to um, Lulua also as the importance of like teaching and breaking stereotypes uh, is that um, my teacher was saying to me, you know, like the, we all, we have like both stereotypes. We have the the negative uh, connotations to ind indigenous people that are in Australia, the drunk man in the outback, uh, and we have like the uh, good connotation stereotypes that is the noble savage. Uh, in the ad back, but both of them are like wrong. Both of them are stereotypes and are like wrong informations. So as a teenager, I was, I was, um, there was a, like a mind shift. Um, so I decided to, um, to study um, one uh, Aboriginal artist that is making contemporary art. So you can see it on the, on this slide. His name is Richard Bell. And basically he was my main um, mind shift. And I think my biggest inspiration until nowadays, until now um, for my art, that's him. You can see him in the picture. He's uh, surrounded by um, his bikini golden girls and boys. And basically what he's doing is that he's like shifting uh, the power. Uh, that's not him anymore uh, that is uh, in the outback, uh, either like drinking or being the noble savage. No, he's just like a citizen living in the cities and that, ha that is surrounded by like blonde um, um, Australian uh, people. And that's like an image that, that we never see, that we never see in the news that I've never uh, read in a book or that I've never seen in a documentary about Australia. And the relation to power and to the relation also of dignity, 
uh, that you were talking um, was also something that uh, really struck me that I kept in my mind. So for um, the rest of my work, I was uh, always trying to like get this line of what Richard Bell was doing and to break up stereotypes. And for one of my uh, subjects that I, I uh, pursue about refugees, I wanted to go against this type. I wanted to break stereotypes, re reversing stigmas. And from all the, the images that we see in like mainstream media, that is like mostly that. And of course, it is important images. It's like news uh, images. But the thing is, if we only see those images about refugees that are in camp or that are drowning in the Mediterranean or that in Paris is like, or living in the camps in like Northern Paris, um, it just gives in the subconscious imaginary an image of the refugee, like with that power, with that dignity, with that education that is poor. And uh, therefore it creates like so much racism and discrimination. I, and I can talk about that uh, coming from Paris, like how there's like so much tension now. Um, uh, bec because also I think of the only like one side image that we have. So <laughs> uh, talking about power and about uh, symbolization, um, this is like the, the uh, photo of the president Emmanuel Macron, the president of France. And to me, I was wondering, okay, what's like the most powerful uh, image that I have? So I thought about him. And it's a really interesting picture because in everything that is in this picture, everything was very well calculated. Um, you can see like the double, um, like I, I can't show you with my mouse, but the double like um, um, mobile phone that he has as like, you know, a person that is always on the move, always like very occupied. The Pleiad is like a book showing like his uh, references, his literal uh, references, but also the old clock. Like everything that is put in this image is telling a story. You know, it's, it may be very subtle, but it's telling his personal story. So I thought, okay, I want to break stereotypes about refugees. Let's do that with the same, um, with the same project. So I put them and I put them in a, in a way of um, dignity and of power because the power was the most important um, uh, thing that I wanted to attach to their image. And I said exactly the same thing. So I went to like Bobigny, which is a suburb in Paris. I went to like a, um, a refugee, um, how do you call that? Um, 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 foyer, sorry, I can't find the word in English. And, uh, and I explained them the, the, the setting, I explained them what I wanted to do, that I wanted to represent them uh, as a president. And they were like, wow, <laughs> we're not yet even accepted as uh, in like a refugee in France. And now like we can be like a, a president. So they were like really into it and I asked them, okay, I, I know you don't have a lot of belongings here because you're in the foyer, but uh, maybe shows me some of the items that you feel like you can relate to. So they uh, either like, you know, put me their, their notebooks because they were like learning French that uh, told me like the story about the bull that they were playing. And anyway, we just like did exactly the same thing, like putting it subtly in the, in the studio of like the presidential um, shoot to tell their story, with, but with dignity and with power. And actually when you see this man, uh, Ranim from Afghanistan, you don't think he's a refugee that, is, is, uh, that went through living uh, under the bridges of Paris. You see him with a shirt, you see him uh, proud, and you see him like in power exactly with the same gesture as the president. Um, so for me, that's like the power of, um, of images is, whoops, sorry, I can't, I, uh, is the power of images is the fact that uh, you can have the same person, but by um, doing, by, by, by showing indefinitely, it, it tells like completely like another story. Um, and this, I haven't put the, the, the caption to their, um, what was on the table, but that it's, it's the same, it's the same thing. So, um, there's like a lot of uh, subject that I'm interested into, and usually it's linked to identity. And for this other project that was about manhood and how um, it's the same thing, like manhood stems from a myth, a myth of virility, um, like for France or from like different parts of the world, like there's, there's different visions, but it's either you have to be strong, you have to be the breadwinner, you have to uh, nurture your sensitivity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I decided to basically take uh, interviews with um, different um, uh, male persons surrounding me and to ask them, you know, what is, uh, what is not fitting like this, this myth that you have? Um, and so it, 
from from what they were saying, then will like create a visual that uh, represents their social testimony. So uh, the man that you see on the on the right hand side, he was basically saying to me that he loved listening to classical music and that he was getting um, uh, ashamed in his uh, suburb in Paris because that was like not. Uh, black music that was not rap that was not hip hop uh, and so he like felt really shamed uh, about it um, the the man on the on the left hand side he says that well he always cries during movies <laughs> and he cries often and this is like things that help to um, to break like stereotypes as well and besides in this project of course uh, I'm talking about the female gaze so for the one that don't know like the male gaze is just the representation of men. And as you were saying, Fada, that like, we as women, female photographer, we're like so little uh, in comparison to our male counterparts. So it's very interesting also to like shift, I think in the process, this relation of power and, uh, and to see actually to make a male pose in front of our camera and for, the, the woman, not, not now to be like uh, subjected to the camera and to the desire of men, but actually uh, to also be in the role of making men pose according to our own project, according to our own uh, inspiration. Um, <clears throat> and so you can see uh, that, you know, I talk to like very like different subjects uh, with my, um, just checking out the time, uh, with, with the people that I try to represent it. So it's all, it can be like the taboo of like not having a beard or uh, the taboo of like, you know, like sexual like taboos also. Uh, and uh, actually by breaking um, taboos, uh, we're also connecting to personal like stories and it's, um, and it's something like that can go to like a variety of um, a theme. Uh, for example, this man in, uh, on the left, he's a Yemeni. And he was telling me, he grew up in France, he's like half Yemeni, half French. And he was telling me that while he was in Yemen, like his father will like, give him a, a jebia, like the, the, the knife that you see, like a traditional knife. But actually uh, when he was like in uh, Paris, like all he wanted to do was like play with his like little pony, uh, you know? So that's like all these like very touching stories that I think like people can relate to uh, and that it is important to um, disclose. And Intimate stories can go also uh, beyond like the, the, the borders. Um, so for this particular project, I was um, documenting how uh, Yemeni people, uh, refugees, exile and diaspora were leaving uh, the war uh, that was happening in Yemen still, uh, but not linked to their country. So we see images of, um, of, of the war in Yemen, but we never see the diaspora and how they are connected to their land, how 24 hours they're trying to get information on which house has been bombarded or not. And I think this is like um, a way of like telling stories that is also interesting is, so it's not uh, documenting, it's not like purely reportage, but it is also telling the story on the ground of like how war is, uh, is happening and affecting life beyond borders. And all these uh, images come of, of course with the testimony, but I didn't like put it in the, in the file. Okay, so now it's a more of a personal um, project like linked to my roots as a French Thai uh, person. Um, I felt that everything from like all, doing all this project, I felt that everything that was personal actually uh, becomes universal. And, and you, can, um, you can see that in like the, the testimony of the people. Um, for example, like this woman on the left, uh, she's, this is like, sorry, this is like a project called Lucring Generation. Lucring means um, half child. And that's how Thai people, mixed Thai people are called in, um, in Thai. So ne they're never like fully accepted as like one full person. Uh, and I encountered that of course, personally, and so in, in, my, in my task of um, understanding my identity, I went to uh, ask questions to other Lukrung on how they construct their identity uh, in between like, you know, the gap of like two cultures. And, um, and what I found really uh, inspiring is that everyone felt like an alien at some point. And I, I think it really enabled me like to, to connect and to, um, how can I say that? Um, to really, 
too late, sorry. Um, yeah, to, to really feel that like everything that is, is personal is universal because everyone uh, that was, um, that I interviewed like, told me like something that I felt like, for example, this, this girl, like she said that she was ashamed of basically saying to her um, uh, friends at school that she will come from Thailand because there are so many stereotypes linked to Thailand as, oh, uh, you must be a children of prostitution, et cetera, et cetera, that she didn't dare. Um, this man on the uh, right hand side, he was so ashamed of saying that he was Thai uh, because he grew up in like in Paris that he wanted to take out his eyes uh, and he wanted yeah, he wanted to like um, like hide his eyes and like during high during um, school he like put glasses. The man on the uh, left hand side, that's a bit different. He's um, what he did is that like he's from the Caribbean and he went to Thailand and uh, actually he realized that there's so much racism against black people in, in Thailand that not only people like didn't consider him as a Lucrun because now he's like very praised to be a Lucrun. But uh, people uh, denied him also the fact of being Thai, like he felt invisible. So like from all this testimony, you can um, create like visuals that translate uh, those testimonies. So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and I'll go to um, the project that you mentioned, um, Renin, about the domestic workers. Um, so when I went to Beirut, um, like last year, I wanted to document what was happening to uh, migrant domestic workers. Um, and as you were also um, like saying, like it needs to be like project on the long term because you create like other stories when you work on the long term with, um, with women. And I think that from a women perspective, as you were saying, Afaiba, like uh, you show other things. You don't show like what is on mainstream media. You don't show uh, like, the face if like the woman is like a prostitute or is a victim because you don't want her to be represented like that because she doesn't want it herself so you don't do what uh what you wouldn't like um to be done to you basically so um and i felt also that uh because i want to bridge uh stories to other people we we have to like um try to exclude the othering so by showing the common humanity that we share with these women, actually they're not just like migrant domestic workers in Lebanon anymore. They're just girls like having fun on the beach and that actually, you know, um, are doing like the same leisures as, uh, as other people can do. So a big part of my documentation about for these women was that, was how are these women are now in position of power, how uh, they know their uh, seduction power also, uh, and how they have fun basically like doing ordinary things. And that's images <clears throat> that I've been told uh, because I'm new in Lebanon, but that most of the people never saw. Uh, they've never been able to see uh, domestic workers actually like having fun and, you know, just like being happy on the beach um, uh, in, in Beirut. Um, and I think when you talk about uh, race, it's also important to like avoid like a kind of like a thing. So that's like theory for, for you, Lula, but how to avoid uh, white saviorism, I feel it's always by highlighting your subject with power, creativity and dignity. So this is <clears throat> like a, um, a film clip like I've done um, showing basically the, the creativity of those domestic workers who wrote a song. Um, who wrote a song about their testimony. And so it basically shows that these women can write, yes, of course, uh, they can tell a story, they can sing, like they have like all this creativity that uh, we as like the privilege must communicate to the rest of the world because these women don't have the means to like show themselves like singing and to show themselves like um, um, creating songs or theater play or many things that they do. So it's the same thing. We as privileged uh, <clears throat> people must uh, be an ally in like showing um, the, creati the creativity of these women. Um, so I talked about or share humanity um, and how it's creating a greater influences. It's because people can bound to like those personal story when like people see this woman dancing, they're like, okay, like she's like dancing like me when I'm having fun, you know? Uh, she's not only like the, 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 
the like a sad face that uh, people don't want to relate to or that they don't um, feel comfortable at looking at. And um, <laughs> for this side, I said, follow your heart, not just the intellect. Uh, it's a personal uh, um, reflection I had because when I wanted to portray migrant domestic workers in Beirut, I was having a bit like this, you know, for the my past project, like a way of imagining uh, how I would portray these women with a uh, fun and uh, with power and, you know, like all the mise en scène that I will do. And actually, I realized that I didn't need to do that because when that happened, uh, those women were like living 14, like one small house in Beirut. And it came naturally to me to like try to bring them to like a public space for them to feel more comfortable because it was so hot and it was so crowded that I brought them to the beach. And then when I brought them to the beach, all these images happen um, like, you know, like uh, intuitively, like they were just displaying their freedom. They were just displaying, displaying their fun and their power. And so sometimes I want to say that you may have images that you imagine in your head, like how you want to like portray them, but always follow your heart first because your heart will also uh, guide you in like finding opportunities uh, to portray the women the way you want to. So that's it. <laughs> and we finished by this. Uh... Wow, that was beautiful, Nani. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for that into your work. Um, I love that you gave us such an insight into your last project, which is so relevant right now. I mean, both you and Fabiha's work is so relevant, but um, you know, it, it, the Beirut tragedy affected all of us very greatly. And these pictures were beautiful, something that I didn't see on anybody's, shared on anybody's page at all. Yeah. So um, thank you for sharing with, uh, with us. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, um, ask one question to all of you. And you guys can each answer this question. But if we can end with, um, what is the role of government in building a more equitable and inclusive creative economy? Well, I think uh, the, uh, the role of the individual, of course, is paramount. The role of the individual artist, creator, uh, even the, uh, the audience member is, is paramount. But the fact is that in many of our societies, the government has the levers of power. The government can allow and uh, disallow, you think about issues like censorship, think about issues like accessibility, public institutions, museums, educational institutions are still largely controlled by the governments in, in, in our part of the world, the wider Middle East, if you wanna call it that, West Asia, North Africa, Africa. So um, I think the government plays an important role, I, but I don't think they can do it alone. I think it definitely is something where you have to have these individuals who are creatives, who are able to propel society forward through their work. What Aline and Fabiha and Lulua talked about is so essential to any society to progress. And I don't think governments can do it. So governments cannot micromanage uh, progress. You need it, it needs to be led by, by the individual. However, we cannot discount the role of the government. If anybody else would like to add something to that? Fabiha? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, exactly. That Sultan Sa said, I, I totally I agree with him because I think like we have to do so many things collaboratively because I'm not good at everything. You're not good at everything. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. So definitely, if we love this planet, if we love humanity, we can do so many work together. We can unite together and continue this advocacy. Um, in these uh, day, days, we become very selfish, isn't it? Like, I mean, everyone is very materialistic and everyone is so self-absorbed. Because of this COVID-19, because of these circumstances, we have understand and we understood one thing that, um, see, like it will affect each of us, no matter from where the virus has come or the calamity will come. So climate change will affect us. Um, so the disaster will affect us. So we need to unite together and do it together. We cannot divide ourselves and we cannot like blame each other, blame government, blame everyone. We have to come to a point where we can unite and find a way for everyone. That is what I feel. Yeah, that was really beautiful. <laughs> and if anybody wants to add, 
Is there any questions from the audience? Also, if you have your questions, you can send it to the chat box that's next to you. If not, then we have two minutes left on our conversation anyway. Um, I appreciate all of you so greatly. It has been a pleasure hosting this panel with you. Um, your, the information and the insights that you've given me personally, um, I'll carry with me. And um, each one of you has given me more things to think about, like I didn't have enough things to think about this year. Um, thank you, C20, for hosting us. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, and hope you have a great rest of your um, summit. Thank you, everybody. And yeah. thank you so much, everyone, and the team behind us who are helping us and aging this process. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, it's totally a privilege being here.